A very good evening to one and all. Welcome to the first live tuition streaming broadcast by Einstein Academy. Personally, I'm pretty excited to be starting this project as I believe that this is one of the first live tuition streaming broadcasts out there. And it might be even be the first um, type of tuition streaming broadcast out there. Okay, so um, to all the viewers that have tuned in, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you could just hit the like button and the share button, I would greatly appreciate it as um, it would help me to uh, reach out to a larger viewership and for more people to benefit from this um, content. Okay, so um, I actually have a secondary monitor here so I will be able to see all your live comments. So if you have any queries or questions about the live streaming or any of con um, questions about the, the content on JCH2 Chemistry which we'll go through in the second part of the live stream, just feel free to type it in the comments and I'll just answer them live as if it was a question. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So um, we'll start with an introduction to live streaming. And I'll start off with an introduction to myself and then the motivation to doing this live streaming, as well as the benefits to the students that are tuning into this live streaming, as well as how the lessons will be conducted. Okay, so a bit about myself. Um, I had the entirety of education in Singapore with the exception of a one semester exchange program in Canada during my university days. So I started off at the Nanyang Primary School before moving on to ACS Independent, followed by ACJC before I did a bachelor's degree in chemistry at the National University of Singapore, and then following which I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship to pursue a PhD degree in chemistry again at the National University of Singapore. So for those of you all that are interested, um, this, uh, this is uh, my certificates from PSLE all the way to my PhD degree. So did reasonably well in primary school and then moved on to ACSI as I mentioned um, after that. So I had many A2s when I was in secondary school so probably was distracted by a lot of like sports and gaming. Yeah, so for the students out there that are tuning in, you really need to put in the hard work and be motivated and to stay focused if you want to get really good grades for O levels or A levels or whatever that you do in life. After that, I went to ACJC where I started to mature a bit, uh, was more focused and put in the hard work and then did uh, better during my A-levels. And then after that, I went to NUS to do a bachelor degree in science, chemistry, and I did well enough to graduate with a first class honours. Following which, again, I mentioned that I was lucky enough to receive a scholarship and my scholarship, the President Graduate Fellowship, allowed me to pursue a PhD degree in chemistry, which I graduated in 2016 and I have been a full-time tutor since then. Okay, so that's a bit about myself and my credentials as a tutor. Okay, so the motivation for me to do this live streaming is because I'm passionate about teaching. I, uh, one of my physics professor in university once mentioned that teaching is the highest form of learning and actually to teach a subject well, you really need to have very strong fundamentals in the subject and be able to um, think of the ways that if you teach a subject whether it will cause any misunderstanding to the students and to anticipate these misunderstandings so that you will be able to constantly, uh, continually improve your way of teaching so that you can teach the material in the uh, easiest way to be understood. So actually if you don't, don't know it, like if you do a reflection on teach, you actually will get learned. So because of the fact that you keep on thinking about the subject content that you are teaching and all these misunderstandings that can arise from the different ways of teaching, you actually learn the most from it. So teaching is really the highest form of learning. And I definitely believe my ability to teach all the content well and almost all of the students that I've taught uh, feel that they can actually understand the concepts easily that I've taught them and be able to apply the concepts to doing the questions. Okay, and one of the main motivation for doing the live streaming is that so that I'm able to subscribe to a wider audience. So be it that if you are giving tuition one-to-one -one or at a, in a classroom setting, you're always limited by space. Whereas if you do a live tuition streaming setting, you are able to reach out to everybody out there. So which brings about the point that I want to make. I guess like this can kind of revolutionize the way that tuition is taught. It can actually be taught through the air, through the internet, instead of having to be in a physical space. And one of, the, one of the things that I was thinking about, maybe school can actually approach this as well. Um, how about having a four-day school week and one day we, the students will actually can stay at home and just listen to a live streaming broadcast. And in this way, you don't actually have to travel to school and can save a lot on traveling time and 
teachers and students can actually have one day of rest in, in every week. Okay, so for the students out there, the advantages of live streaming, so you can actually attend the lessons at the comfort of your own home, saving on transport times to and fro from tuition centers. So let's face it, as in today's um, school hours are actually very, very long. So if you could actually just go home, have a good shower and have a good rest before you just look at your computer and tune into live streaming, it would actually be much better than having to travel to a tuition center for lessons. And the other benefit that I was actually thinking of is that students that are shy in asking questions could actually be more willing to ask questions enormously during the lesson. So a lot of the times that I feel students, especially Singapore students, are actually very shy in asking questions because they are worried that the question that they will ask is like a stupid question and the peers will be wondering why are you asking such a dumb question. So over the air, hopefully um, people can are more willing to ask such questions since it's kind of anonymous. And honestly, don't be worried to ask as much questions as you want because a lot of the questions that you are puzzled about is probably your friends are also actually puzzled about. So by asking, it will actually go a long way in helping the everybody in improving in the subject. So let me just check. Give me a moment, please. Okay, if anybody is tuning out there, if you could just drop a comment to let me know that you guys are actually able to type comments, it would really benefit me a lot so that I know that I'm not talking to air, which kind of I am. This is the part that I'm still trying to get used to, talking in front of a com to nobody. It's kind of very strange. I'm try still trying to get used to it, but hopefully um, as time goes by, it will get better. Okay, so the fees for this live streaming, it's completely free for now. And my aim is to build up viewership and allow viewers to have a taste of how the lessons will be conducted. And yep. And then like in the future, that could be a small subscription fee in the future. But since I'm able to cater to a wider audience, the subscription fee will be nowhere near any existing tuition fees and it will definitely be much cheaper than any existing tuition fees. The, as mentioned in the messages that I've sent out, the subjects that's being taught now is A-level H2 chemistry, but as a tutor, I actually teach O-level chemistry, O-level physics, O-level EMF and O-level AMF. So in the future, if there's really a demand for it and the reception to this live streaming is good, then I will have plans to have lessons on these topics as well. The plan currently is to have a two hours lesson every Monday, um, but depending on how it goes, I would probably say that the each lesson will be about between one and a half hours to two hours each, as well, me talking continuously for two hours is kind of pretty long, especially I'm kind of like talking to myself. Yeah, so we'll see how it goes, but every lesson will be between one and a half hours to two hours each. Okay, so that's for the introduction to this live streaming. So I'll talk about usually how I conduct my lessons. So in every question that you encounter, you, there's usually a problem solving structure. And the number one step is first you read the question. And then usually what you do is that you identify the topic in the question. And having identified the topic in the right question, you will search through the concepts that you learned in the topic. And then you apply the right concept before you get to the answer for that topic. So... Sorry, just give me a moment. I just want to check that the live screen is actually running. Okay, I believe it is. It says that 10 people reached, but kind of like if somebody could type a comment saying that um, you all could actually hear this, it would be great. Okay, so anyway, like I mentioned, this is the problem solving structure and this is kind of like somebody and this is basically the way I'll be approaching the content for each topic. So I I actually I actually self-crafted PowerPoint slides to go through the concepts for each topic and this will address this part of the problem solving structure. I would first teach well the concepts for each topic and then I would also go through questions and we'll teach students how to effectively apply this problem solving structure. So basically look at the question, identify the topic, and then I'll tell you how to apply the concept in the topic before you can get to the answer. So I will also answer the questions that's asked live by students in the comment section, which at the moment there are no comments. Hopefully this thing is actually running as it's supposed to be. 
And then um, at the end of every topic, I actually plan to have a Q&A session for students just to ask questions on um, basically anything under the sky, um, but mainly just the questions that's related to the topics that I've just gone through. Okay, so basically that sums up the introduction to this live streaming. And I would just like open up um, Q&A for anybody if they have questions regarding this live streaming. And if not, I will just jump straight into the content for GCH2 chemistry on the chapter on atomic structure. And if not, I will just jump straight into the content. Alright, um, JCH2 chemistry, the first chapter that I'm going to go through is on the chapter on atomic structure. So um, if you look at all the notes that I have, at the start is always the learning outcomes. And this learning outcomes is actually a set of checklist questions that Cambridge actually gives to you. And actually at the end of every topic, you should make sure that you go through these learning outcomes and think of every learning outcome as a question and ask yourself whether you are able to answer these questions with an answer. So let me show you all where you all can get this set of learning outcomes. So if you all were to just Google for JCH2 Chem syllabus, click on this. And then as you scroll down, this piece of document is a very important piece of document which a lot of students never ever knew that it exists. But if you were to scroll down to this part where it says core idea matter one subject content, you will see that there's actually a set, there's actually a set of learning outcomes. And in the learning outcomes, for example, for the chapter on atomic structure, candidates should be able to identify and describe protons, neutrons, and electrons in terms of relative charges and relative masses. So these are actually checklist questions that Cambridge expects you to really know. So when you're preparing for exam, you should actually do this checklist questions to make sure that you really understand the content well. If you're able to answer every question from these learning outcomes, you can say that basically you're well prepared for the test or exam for this chapter. So what I highly recommend all my students to do is the following. So you can like use words or any A4 piece of paper. You can like just type for example atomic structure. Right and then like uh, just to make it nicer like that and then you can copy and paste this learning outcome okay. and then like at the bottom of this oops just to make it nicer at the bottom of this you can write the answer to this learning outcome and then you do it for all the learning outcome and when you're revising for every chapter this summary sheet is actually all you need to have in order to uh, prepare for your exam for this topic Okay, yeah, so I highly recommend all my students to do this as a, uh, to make sure that you actually understand that um, that chapter well before you are going for any test or exam. Okay, so I'm going to close this and move back um, to the PowerPoint slides for atomic structure. So these are all the learning outcomes and it's at the start of all my PowerPoint slides. Okay, so the model of an atom. The atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the chemical property of the element. So in chemistry and in physics, for in all the sciences, definitions are actually very important. But this one, this definition is kind of one of the one that's not really that important. So it's okay not to remember this definition. But for completeness sake, we'll define the atom to be the smallest particle of an element such that it retains the chemical properties of the element. So I don't know whether you guys have actually thought about it, but when I was young, I actually played with Lego bricks, right? And it's actually pretty amazing that using the same set of Lego bricks, you can actually build many, many different models of different things. So that actually made me wonder, right, in our world, you have, for example, like spoons, chopsticks, hands, eyes, and everything. Are they actually made up of like very simple Lego bricks and they're actually just being constructed in different ways? And kind of the answer is really yes. And um, there are actually atoms in the periodic table and if you arrange the atoms in different ways you can actually um, build up different things such as your fork and spoon, eyes and hands. So the fundamental building blocks of all this 
all this stuff that you see around is really the atom but then you can then ask whether an atom is it actually made out of smaller particles and kind of when i was young i actually thought that basically if you understand the smallest particles in the universe you actually understood everything about the universe so sorry <coughs> so that was the way that i thought but anyway so back to this an atom is indeed made out of smaller particles known as subatomic particles smaller than atom particles so the proton has a charge of plus one a mass of one unified atomic mass unit a neutron has a charge of zero and a mass of one unified atomic mass unit as well and an electron has a charge of minus one and a mass of one over one eight four zero unified atomic mass unit you can actually ask a further question can the proton be subdivided into smaller particles and can the neutron be divided into sub um, sub neutronic particles if there's such a word so the answer is actually yes the proton can be divided into three quarks which is an up up down quark and the neutron can be divided into a down down up quark but this is obviously way beyond the A-level syllabus, I'm just discussing this for interest sake. So the proton and the neutron can be divided into smallest particle called quarks, but it seems at this point of our understanding, quarks cannot be further divided into smaller particles. On, on the other hand, the electron is really the smallest particle, fundamental particle that makes up all of matter, and the electron as we know it now cannot be divided into a smaller particle. Okay, so let me jump ahead to this slide first, and then the next slide. So as you can see, my notes right is built in a way that there's content, and then it will hit this checkpoint um, learning outcome, and then like the learning outcome is basically identify the, and describe protons, neutrons, and electrons in terms of their relative charges and relative masses. So the way my notes are structured is that the content before this like this checkpoint is basically used to answer this learning outcome. So if you are not able to answer this learning outcome having me gone through all the previous slides then you should actually go back to the previous slides and make sure you understand the content and write down the answer to this learning outcome before you move on in the lesson okay so let me read this learning outcome first so it says identify and describe protons neutrons and electrons in terms of their relative charges and relative masses so one word that i really want to highlight here is the word uh, relative okay so rel why would you say relative charges so if we go back to this slide the charge of a proton in SI units is actually 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. Oops. There. Sorry. Then to 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs, a very, very small number in terms of the SI unit of charge. And the SI unit, um, as in and the charge for an electron, is the similarly minus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. It's indeed a very small number if you go by the SI units of coulombs for charge. But because the learning outcome actually says that we're only interested in their relative charges, so like for example, the simplest ratio of the charge of a proton and electron is like one is a one is to one ratio. But the charges are just opposite in the sense that the charge of a proton is plus one units and the charge of an electron is minus one unit. So that's the meaning of relative charges. We are not interested in absolutely what's the charge on it. Like for example, if you have an elephant that's like one kilotons or something like that, and then another elephant is just 150 kilotons, the relative units is like one is to 1.5. We are not interested in the actual mass or the actual charge of the object. We're just talking about the simplest ratio. So that's why the relative numbers is just plus one and minus one. Whereas for the charge of a neutron, it's zero, it's neutral. And that's the where the words neutron come from. It stems from the word neutral. And then if you look at the mass, the actual mass of the subatomic particles, the mass of a proton is this number, 1.672 times 10 to the power minus 24 grams, a very small number indeed. And the mass of the neutron is this number. And you can see that the mass of the proton and the neutron is very similar. So in terms of simplest ratio, they are like kind of one is to one ratio. Whereas for the electron, it's much, much smaller than the mass of either the proton or the neutron. So it's actually this, but for simplicity sakes, we can actually say that the mass of an electron is kind of just negligible as compared to the mass of a proton and or neutron. Okay, so I hope, basically this table sums up the learning outcome, but I just want to emphasize on the word relative to make sure that you all actually understand what it, what it is. And in fact, when we are doing measurements, we are always measuring things relative one to one another. So as a simple case, right, actually when you learn physics, oops, 
When you learn physics, you actually know that if you have a weighing scale and then you want to measure the mass of an object, right? So let's say you want to measure the mass of this box. What you actually do is that you will just keep on putting like 1 kg masses and then you will just like keep on putting the 1 kg masses until it balances out and then you will say that the mass of the box is the sum of the masses of the is the sum of the masses that you put on the other side but you can actually ask the question of like how how do we know that this is 1 kg right because like there must be something at the start that is not you can't do this method because we haven't defined what 1 kg is so the truth is that actually you will be always define a standard and everybody in the world will just agree and define this standard to be 1 kg and based on this we are just measuring the mass of everything relative to this 1 kg that we have defined if it's like three times the mass of this then we'll say that that thing is 3 kg if it's like half the mass of the object that we define then we we'll define that thing will have a mass of actually half a kg so just understand that when we're measuring things we always have to define a standard everybody just have to agree on number on that object and then we have to basically measure everything relative to the object that we define okay i hope so far everything is okay i haven't seen any comments hopefully it's not due to some technical issues but uh yeah as in like please if you have any questions please feel free to type it in the comment section so that i can actually see and answer any queries that you all might have Okay, moving on. The behavior of beams of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an electric field. So, if you were to pass a beam of proton, neutron, and electron through an electric field, basically a plus plate and a minus plate. So, the most important type of attraction in chemistry is electrostatic attraction, which basically means that, right, if you have a plus charge and you have a minus charge, they will actually be attracted to each other. And if you have a plus charge and a plus charge, you will repel. And similarly, if you have a minus charge and you have a minus charge, you will repel. You will repel each other. Okay, I'm sorry. Probably I should write this as... Okay, attract. If I could write... Yep, attract. Okay, and the thing... Uh, yeah, okay, so... So basically, right, if you pass a beam of proton through an electric field, because the proton is positively charged, first of all, it will be attracted to the negative plate instead of the positive plate. In fact, it will actually be repelled by the positive plate. The electron, on the other hand, will be repelled by the negative plate and attracted toward the positive plate. The neutron, since it's neutral, it's neither positively charged nor negatively charged. It will just pass straight through in an electric field, since it will neither be attracted to either plates. So that's one key difference. Number one, proton is attracted to the negative plate, the electron is attracted to the positive plate. The second difference is that because the electron is has a much smaller mass than the proton, it will actually be deflected much more than the proton. So if you think about it, if you are on a river bed and you are pulling two animals on the river, the heavier animal will actually travel slower towards the river bank. And since the proton actually has a larger mass, it will actually be deflected much slower towards the negative plate and therefore the angle of deflection will actually be smaller as compared to the angle of deflection for the electron which will be, which will be bigger because it's actually moving faster towards the positive plate okay so uh, one so to add on right so if you have a plus charge and a minus charge the force of attraction is actually proportional to q plus q minus over r plus plus r minus Okay, so let me explain what this means. So basically Q plus is basically the charge on the plus charge. So if you will have to have a 2 plus charge and a 1 minus charge and then another one which is a 1 plus charge and a 1 minus charge, you would expect that the attraction between the first case to be stronger. Basically the Q plus in the first case is 2 plus 2 and the Q minus in the first case is minus 1 and for the second case the Q plus is 1 plus and the Q minus is minus 1. So if you multiply 2 by 1, you will get a bigger number. So it means that the forces of attraction between charges which are larger in magnitude will actually be higher. This R plus plus R minus is basically saying it's basically the radius of the positive charge. It's basically the radius of the positive charge and the radius of the negative charge, or basically the distance that is between 
these two charges. So for example, if I were to place the one plus charge and the one minus charge at a shorter distance between each other, they will actually be more strongly attracted. I, I think that this is pretty intuitive. If you have two magnets, the stronger the magnet, the stronger the attraction between the magnets. And if you were to put the magnets closer, the magnets will also attract each other more strongly. Okay, so this is a very fundamental principle in all of chemistry that because all forces are electrostatic forces of attraction, so you need to know what are the factors that influences how strong two charges attract each other. Okay, moreover, the angle of deflection is proportional to Q over M, whereby the Q is the charge of the particle and the M is the mass of the particle. So as you can see, the M is in the denominator, meaning that if the mass is larger, the angle of deflection will be smaller since it will actually deflect slower towards the plate. And if the charge is higher, the attraction of that charge towards either the plus or the minus plate will be stronger and hence it will be deflected um, at, with a larger angle of deflection because it will actually move faster towards the plate. If the angle of deflection is proportional to Q over M, then we can also write the angle of deflection to be equal to K times Q over M, whereby K is a proportionality constant. So, um, so to make sure that we understand what we are talking about, right, in math, for example, if you have Y is proportional to X, right, we can also write Y is equal to K times X, whereby k is a proportionality constant. So in any equation, it's basically a relationship between variables and usually what happens is that if you know one of the variable, you can solve for the other variable. So what it means is that if you tell me the charge and the mass of any particle, I will be able to tell you what is the angle of deflection as you pass it through the electric field. So, but you know, the problem with this with this equation, not a problem, I mean a technical issue, is that because there's a proportionality constant, which we need to find before we can actually apply this equation to um, different cases. So let me give you an example. Let me keep the okay, so as an example, right? Yeah, let me just change. Okay, so as an example, let's say we say that we are going to pass a 4,2 helium 2 plus ion through an electric field and we find out experimentally that it's deflected by an angle of 15 degrees. So since the angle is equals to K times Q over M, we can use this test case that we did through an experiment to actually find out the proportionality constant. So what we'll do is we'll just plug in the, the corresponding variables into the equation. So we will get 15 is equals to K. The charge is 2 plus or plus 2 mathematically. And then the mass is the nucleon number which we haven't gone through but um, I hope that um, if you have a prerequisite from O-level chemistry, you will know that this is the nucleon number, which is basically the sum of all the protons and neutrons in the atom, which basically makes up all the mass of the atom. So this will be 4, and you can solve for K, which is equals to 30. And now, having passed this test charge through the electric field, we will come to the equation that we need, which is angle is equals to 30 times Q over M. So now, if you tell me the charge and the mass of any particle, I don't have to pass it through the electric field. I actually can straight away tell you the angle of what the angle of deflection will be. So let's try a few examples using this test case. So for example, if I, if I were to pass a, a hydrogen proton through the electric field, right? So the angle of deflection will be equals to 30 times the Q, which is plus 1, over the mass, which is 1. And I will find out that this answer is 30 degrees. Which means that if I were to pass a proton through an electric field, the angle will actually be deflected by 30 degrees. So I can write actually a plus here to indicate that the angle the the proton the hydrogen ion is actually deflected towards the negative plate. On the other hand, if I have a chloride ion, and this let's say is the 35 isotope, the angle of deflection will be equals to 30 minus 1 over 35. And if I were to solve for this, it will be some small number, minus some minus degree. And I can find out that the chloride ion will be deflected towards the positive plate since there's a plus here. 
and then it'll be deflected by whatever angle this number is. Let's try another case for the neutron. So for the neutron, right, the angle of deflection will be equal to 30 times the charge, but however, the charge of a neutron is zero. So if you plug it into this equation, uh, over the, sorry. The charge of a neutron is zero, and then the mass is one. Since zero multiplied by any number is zero, you will get angle of zero degrees, and hence that's the reason why the neutron actually pass uninterrupted through the electric field. Yeah, so I finally can see someone has tuned into this broadcast. Hopefully you're not the only one, I'm actually not sure, but I actually can see from my secondary monitor that someone has tuned into this broadcast. So hopefully this is actually working well. Okay, so basically that's how you use the angle of deflection to solve questions when you pass particles that are charged through an electric field. And this addresses this learning outcome, deduce the behavior of beams of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an electric field. So let me summarize again. Since protons is positively charged, it's deflected towards the negative plate. Since electrons is negatively charged, it's deflected towards the positive plate. And then since neutrons is actually neutral, it will pass straight through the electric field. And the second important difference is that since the proton is much more massive than the electron, the angle of deflection for the proton is smaller than that of the electron. And the precise relationship is that the angle of deflection is proportional to the charge over mass ratio. Okay, so we have gone through basically um, two learning outcomes. And I would do some questions with you all to help you all understand how to apply this concept. So as you can see, this set of, sorry, this set of checklist questions, the first one is identify and describe protons, blah, blah, blah. There's actually no questions below it, which kind of summarizes that A-level actually hasn't set a question that is directly addressing this learning outcome. And actually, if you look at all the A-level question, you can actually um, you can actually link them to a particular learning outcome they are trying to test you. So I hope that this emphasizes the importance of each learning outcome because kind of if you read a question and you know that they're testing for the learning outcome, you just have to go through your memory to find the concept that's related to this learning outcome in order to solve the question. Okay, so like question A, describe what is meant by the term nucleon number. So we haven't gone through this, but it's basically the sum of uh, is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and hence it's the nucleon number because it's the number of nucleons, and nucleons are actually protons and neutrons. So as I've described just now, state two ways in which the behavior of electrons in electric field differs from that of protons. So I actually given you all the answer a lot of times during um, when I go through the content. So electrons are deflected towards the positive plate, whereas the proton is deflected towards the negative plate. And then the other difference is that since the, the mass of the electron is much smaller than that of the proton, the electron is deflected at a larger angle towards the positive plate as compared to that of the proton. Okay, so this was a 2010 A-level question. So all these questions that I'm using are actually really A-level questions to let you all know that I'm not just making up some questions so that it can tie in nicely into the way I teach it, right? So it's really, Cambridge really sets the question that's testing you on some particular learning outcome. Okay, so to another question, like November 2012, beams of charged particles are deflected by electric field. If the particles are all traveling at the same speed through an electric field of constant strength, the angle of deflection is proportional to the charge over mass ratio. So they're actually kind enough to tell you this relationship. Uh, in a particular experimental setup, protons are deflected through an angle of plus 15 degrees. So we can immediately write this. Oh, let me see whether I can write or not. Mm. Sorry, let's give it a moment. Yep, so if, uh, okay, so 15 plus 15, oops, fifth, fifth, uh, oh, sorry. Fifteen. Okay, wait. This is. Like, let me just insert a slide here. 
Okay, so um to the example. Fifteen is equal to for a proton, hence is k times charge of plus one over the mass of one, and therefore k is equal to fifteen. And therefore we know that the angle of deflection is now 15 times the charge over the mass ratio of any particle that we are interested in. So if we were to go back to the question, so basically this test example, the protons being deflected through an angle of 15 degrees, basically gives us the k. And after that, assuming an identical set of experimental conditions, by what angles will the following particles be deflected? So if you look at this deuterium ion, okay, so I'm just going to write it T minus so what we're interested in is D minus T2 plus as well as the last one which is HE2 plus. Okay, so the deuterium, okay, so the angle of deflection for the deuterium will be equal to 15 multiplied by a charge of minus 1 and the mass of the question actually gives it to you yeah so deuterium is um, 2 hydrogen which means that um, the mass will be 2 which will come out to be an angle of minus 7.5 degrees and this is basically opposite the you notice that the sign is opposite to that of the proton and therefore the deuterium ion will actually be deflected towards the positive plate and then for the T2 plus ion, that's the tritium. So the angle of deflection will be equal to 15 multiplied by plus 2 over tritium. So as in it will be 3. So this will be an angle of plus 10 degrees. Okay, sorry, I didn't put in the angle. Okay, and then for the last case, the helium atom, the angle of deflection will be equal to 15 multiplied by plus 2 over a mass of 4 okay and then the angle of deflection will be plus 7.5 degrees okay so basically this is what I've actually taught you all how to use the relationship of the angle of deflection being proportional to the charge over the mass ratio and I hope that it's clear to you all how you are going to use this if you have any questions again just feel free to type it in the comment section so that I can answer it on the fly okay if not I'll move on to the next learning outcome okay so in the model of an atom the atom consists of a positively charged nucleus at the center which is made up of the protons and neutrons and the electrons revolve freely around the nucleus this is actually a very loose way of defining the model of an atom and for those of you out there who actually understand more about the behavior of electrons you will know that it's not really true that the electron is actually moving freely around the nucleus but at the A level standard, I guess it's okay that we accept this model. So if you look at the pictorial view, you can see that the neutrons and the protons are right in the middle and they actually form the nucleus of the atom. And then the electrons revolve around the um, nucleus of the atom. So the average size of the nu atomic nucleus is very small. The protons and the neutrons are actually packed quite closely towards the center of the atom. And the size of the atom is actually much much bigger than that of the nucleus and therefore a lot of the atom is actually empty space and the space in which the electron moves around the nucleus is actually quite empty. Okay, almost all the mass of the atom is contained in the nucleus because the protons and neutrons are the one that's contained in the nucleus and as we have already gone through, the relative mass of the proton and neutron is much much bigger than that of the electron and hence that's the reason why almost all the mass of the atom is contained in the nucleus because the mass of the atom is very sp uh, the mass of the electron is actually very small negligible compared to the mass of a proton and a neutron okay and most of the atom is empty space where the electrons move as i've already mentioned Okay, so describe the distribution of mass and charges within an atom so the mass is distributed such that the majority of the mass is in the nucleus um, and then for the charges, the positive charge is in the nucleus whereas the negative charge is actually around the entire nucleus because of the electrons revolving around it. Let me see if there's any questions relating to this learning outcome. Oh, sorry. So as in I actually didn't finish going through this question. Under identical conditions, 
A beam of particles R, each having 12 times the mass of a proton, was deflected by an angle of plus 5 degrees. Suggest the overall charge on a particle of R. So, uh, yeah, so, okay, wait. So, anyway, just now we, oh, crap, sorry. Let me just try this again, it's quite... Okay, so just now what we did was that, um, what was K just now, sorry. Yeah, so going back to that, we just now we solved that K is equals to 15. So it was, if we were to use that K is equals to 15, we will get the angle of deflection is equals to 15 multiplied by Q over M. Okay, so like now it's telling us that the angle of deflection is actually plus 5 and then this is 15 and then the it's actually asking us to find the charge and they actually tell us that the mass the mass is 12 times that of the proton so this is 12 R. okay like the denominator is a 12 in it which is not allowing me to write okay this just gets Yeah, 12. And using this equation, then we can solve for the overall charge on the particle of R. It will actually be a positive, uh, no, it will be a positive number. Given that the particle of R contains six protons, do the number of neutrons and electrons in a particle of R. So have, uh, wait, let me see. Okay, so if R has 12 times the mass of a proton and the particle of R contains six protons, then it must be true that the number of neutrons is actually six. So after you find the charge, okay, wait, let me just do this, right? So um, 60 divided by 5. Okay, so we know that Q is minus 4. Sorry, let's just go back and just 15 is... Okay, so um, Q is actually plus 4. And if Q is plus 4, right, so we know that the particle R has 6 protons and it has a, nu uh, it has a nuclear number of 12 and it has a charge of plus 4. Plus four, which must mean that the number of protons is equals to six as given in the question. The number of neutrons is also equals to six because it's twelve minus six. Okay, so I haven't gone through the nuclear number, but basically for um, all of you that have prerequisite in O level chemistry, you should know that this is the nuclear number, which is the sum of the number of the nucleons, which is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. So if you take the sum of the number of protons and neutrons minus the number of protons, you will get the number of neutrons. And since the charge of this is plus 4 and the proton number is 6, it will mean that the number of electrons is equal to just 2. Okay, so that's how you solve this entire question for this entire question on that's testing you on this learning outcome. Deduce the behavior of beams of protons, neutrons and electrons in an electric field. Okay, so um, as you can see here, describe the distribution of mass and charges within an atom. Under there, there is no question, which indicates that for so far in the A-level um, questions, there's no question that's directly addressing this learning outcome. Okay, so I'll move on to the next learning outcome. Okay, so um, to this concept on proton number, proton number is simply, the definition of proton number is simply the number of protons. You can just like kind of like switch the words around. And therefore, 
um, it's commonly represented by the symbol Z as sh shown here in this line. Since atoms are electrically neutral, the number of protons will be equal to the number of electrons. And if I tell you the number of protons for a particular atom, I don't have to tell you the number of electrons because they will always be equal in an, in an atom. Okay. Whereas nucleon number is the number of nucleons and the nucleons is the number of particles in the nucleus, which is basically the number of protons and neutrons. Since we already discussed the structure of an atom, which places the protons and neutrons at the center of the atom. It's commonly represented by the symbol A, so it's usually written like that. This is the chemical symbol for the element. And then you have a number for the mass number, which or the nucleon number, which is the number of protons plus neutrons. And then you have a number for the number of protons. So obviously, if you take the num the nucleon number, multiply by sorry. If you take the nucleon number, subtract away the proton number, you will get the number of neutrons in this atom of this uh, in this atom. Okay, so one thing I'd just like to point out here is that okay, so for example, let's give a test example um give a example, right? Concrete example. If you have this notation, 12, 6 carbon, 12 will be the nucleon number, which means that the number of protons plus the number of neutrons is 12, and the number of protons is 6. So if you were to take 12 minus 6, you will get the number of neutrons. And since the atom is electrically neutral, the number of electrons must be exactly equal to the number of protons, which is equal to 6. So I understand that in my slide presentation, I actually write that the mass number is actually on top and the atomic number is below. But not all periodic tables are written in this way. So let me show you what I mean, right? So as an example, this, the bigger number is on top, which is the nuclear number, and the small number, the new proton number is actually at the bottom. But if you were to search for a periodic table online, so this is the one that I always use. Dynamic periodic table. You can see that the nucleon number is actually at the bottom, whereas the proton number is at the top. So don't be mistaken that basically the nucleon number must always be at the top and the proton number must always be at the bottom. This is just not true. But understand that the bigger number must always be the nucleon number since it's protons plus neutrons and the smaller number must always be the proton proton number okay so understand this i'm just telling you that different periodic tables can be written in different ways and there's no fixed format that the nucleon number must always be at the top of the atom symbol okay now to ions ions are electrically charged species form when atoms or molecules lose or gain one or more electrons. Later when we study ionic bond or some of most of you all will have familiarity with ionic bonding, you will know that when metals lose electrons, they will become positively charged and when non-metals gain electrons, they will become negatively charged. So ions are electrically charged species form when they either gain or lose one or more electrons. So for example, for a sodium metal, if you lose one electron, it will form the Na plus ion because the number of electrons is one less than the number of protons. And when aluminium loses three electrons, it will form the Al3 plus ion since the number of electrons is three times less than that. Not Sorry, not three times less than that. The number of electrons is just three less than the number of protons. On the other hand, for the non-metals, they actually gain electrons usually. So when chlorine gains one electron, it will form the Cl minus ion since it will now have one more electron than the number of protons. And for oxygen, when it gains two electrons, it will form the O2 minus ion where the number of electrons is two more than that of the number of protons. Okay, so again, back to this test um, concrete example where you have 11, 23. So the, this is the proton number. So we immediately know that the number of protons is 11. And we know that the number of neutrons is 23 minus 11, which is 12. However, because this particle is not electrically neutral, it's not an atom. So the number of protons will not be equal to the number of electrons. In fact, the number of protons is actually one more than that of the number of electrons. And since the number of protons is 11, the number of electrons must be 11 minus 1, which is equal to 10, so that it actually has one more proton than that of the electron to have an overall positive charge of plus one. Another example, aluminum three plus, the number of protons is 13, since that's the proton number. The nuclear number is 27, and hence the number of neutrons is 27 minus 13, which is equal to 14. 
Okay, since the AL3 plus ion has a charge of 3 plus, it means that it has to have 3 more protons than that of electrons. And since it has 13 protons, it must mean that it actually has only 10 electrons. The F minus ion, number of protons is 9, number of neutrons is 19 minus 9, it goes to 10, and since it has a charge of minus 1, it has to have one more electron than the number of protons, which is equal to 9 plus 1, which is equal to 10. And then for the final example, O2 minus ion, 8 protons, 16 minus 8 neutrons, 8 neutrons, and then 2 minus charge means that 2 more electrons than the number of protons, so the number of electrons is 8 plus 2, which is equal to 10. Okay, on to isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element which have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. Basically in the nucleus they have the same number of protons but not the same number of neutrons. And I hope that you all understand that in if you look through the periodic table, right, basically from element to element, right, the proton number actually decides the identity of that element. So if you change from a proton number, if you have one proton in your nucleus, you are a hydrogen atom. If you have two protons in your nucleus, it's the helium atom. If you have 17 new protons in your nucleus, you are the chlorine atom. You can have different number of neutrons, but you will still be the same, it will still be the same identity. So bottom line is that the identity is only determined by the proton number. But you can have different number of neutrons, and hence that's the concept of the word isotope. And because the chemical properties of an atom is only solely determined by the number of valence electrons, but Isotopes have the same number of protons means that they also must have the same number of electrons and therefore they will have actually the exact same chemical properties since they only differ by the number of neutrons which actually does not affect the chemical property. However, isotopes since they have different number of neutrons they will have different masses and hence they will actually have slightly different physical properties. So isotopes what do you know, need to know about it? You need to define them. You need to know that they are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons and their chemical properties are exactly the same but their physical properties differ very slightly due to the difference in masses. Okay, so on to this learning outcome. Deduce the number of protons, neutrons and electrons present in both atoms and ions given proton and nucleon numbers. So this, uh, this is from all these examples that I've gone through with you all. This addresses that learning outcome. Describe the contribution of protons and neutrons to atomic nuclei in terms of proton number and atomic and nuclear number and to distinguish between isotopes on the basis of different number of neutrons present. So basically the definition of isotopes. Okay, if we were to jump to this learning outcomes. Okay. 2008 um, MCQ question. Some isotopes are unstable and decompose naturally. In one type of decomposition, a neutron in the nucleus decomposes to form a proton which is retained in the nucleus and an electron is expelled from the atom. So which change describes a process of this sort? Okay, so let's read again, right? Um, the neutron decomposes to form a proton which means that the number in at the end of the day, one neutron will disappear and then you actually turn into a proton. So it must mean that number of protons must have increased. And as I already told you, right, the identity of an atom is solely de de determined by the proton number. So if the proton number has increased by 1, you will know that the identity of the atom cannot remain the same. So for this, like 11C to 12C, this cannot be an answer because the identity of the atom has not changed. And you can immediately rule out C because again, the identity of the atom has not changed. So we are left with B and D. Sodium and neon, if you look at sodium, sodium is here in the periodic table. When it turns into neon, it actually loses one proton. So that can also not be the answer. Whereas for potassium turning into calcium, potassium when it gains one, elect, uh, one proton, it will turn into a calcium atom. And hence the answer must be, the answer must be D. Okay, just by analyzing the fact that the number of protons has increased by one, the, uh, the identity of the atom has to change and you have to go from a, because K is group one, so you have to go from a group one to a group two metal. Okay, so the next question, lithium metal and its compounds have many uses. 
ranging from nuclear chemistry, rechargeable batteries, air purification, organic reactants, re reagents, and pharmaceuticals. Naturally occurring lithium contains the isotopes 6 lithium and 7 lithium. What is meant by the terms proton number and nucleon number? So as you can see, a lot of the questions is just directly turning the learning outcome into a question. So imagine if you actually did the summary they asked you how to do, right? You can, it's really kind of like spotting the question. So it's really a freebie for you all. So the proton number is basically the number of protons and the nucleon number is the number of nucleons, which is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. A nuclear reaction is a reaction in which there's a change to an atomic nucleus. An experimental nuclear reactor uses 6 lithium and deuterium as fuel and 3 nuclear reactions between these two atoms are described below. So P plus is a proton and N is a neutron and suggest the identities of X and Y. So when I'm going through this question, right, I actually find this question a very weird question because it's actually like on nuclear reaction which is actually not in the domain of chemistry. So it's, it's kind of a bit unfair to ask this because um, there are actually rules that govern what can happen during a nuclear reaction and what cannot happen. but for simplicity sake, um, in this question, they are just trying to balance the number of protons and neutrons on either side of the equation. So if you look at this, okay, yeah, I'm pointing to the screen. <laughs> if you look at the six lithium, if you look at this six lithium, and if you check the periodic table, lithium has um, three protons. So this is actually, this is actually six, three, lithium plus 2 1 hydrogen and it turns into 4 2 helium plus x plus neutron okay so if you look at the neutron right the top is the nuclear number which means that it's one because it the number of protons plus the number of neutrons is one right it's just a neutron and the number of protons the proton number is zero since there's no proton so we can actually can write it like that so if we were to balance the top and to balance the bottom we would be able to get the number of we were able to get the proton number and the nuclear number for x so this is six plus two is eight and on the right hand side we have five which means that x must be three at the top and since this is 3 and 1, it's like 4, the, the number of protons on the left hand side is 4. And for the right hand side so far is 2, right? Which means that this must be 2. Okay, this is annoying. Okay, so if it's 3, 2, and you go back and check your periodic table, if the proton number is 2, it must be a helium atom. And therefore, like, this x is actually the 3, 2 helium. After finding the proton number, you can go back to the periodic table to check the identity of the atom. For the second one, it's the exact same way of doing it. So you have 6, 3 lithium. And then you have 2, 1 hydrogen. And then you turn into y. And then the p plus. Okay, so the p plus the number of new uh, the number of nucleons is one because the number of protons plus neutron is just one, right? It's the proton, and then like the proton number is one. So again, if we balance just the nucleon number and the proton number separately, six plus two is eight. So like this must be seven at the top. Three plus one is four, so this must be three. So again, you can go back to the periodic table to check what is this. If you the proton number of three will be the lithium atom which means that y must be 7, 3, lithium. Okay, so that's how you go about solving this question, just by balancing the number of protons and the number of neutrons that's on either side of the equation. To be fair, this is actually a nuclear reaction, like I said, and there are actually rules to what can happen and what cannot happen. And yeah, we just got to take this question with a bit, with a pinch of salt that is done like that. Okay, so uh, to the next learning outcome, which is like the heavy one. And this is the first time that y'all, y'all will encounter atomic orbitals. Okay, this is something that is important. And it will be a bit longer. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so... 
we already mentioned that an atom actually has some number of protons, some number of neutrons, and some number of electrons. And we mentioned that the protons and neutrons are just at the nucleus. We haven't discussed about the electrons, how is it actually placed around the atom. So, so what, what I mean is really this. So for example, if you like got eight electrons, right? Like how do you place the eight electrons around the nucleus? Like if you got eight pair of shoes, right? How, how would you put them in the different boxes of shoe boxes that you have? And how does the shoe boxes actually look like? Okay, so Erwin Schrodinger is an Austrian scientist. Hopefully it's Austrian, forgive me if I'm wrong. He invented, uh, he discovered the Schrodinger equation that basically um, provides accepted description of microscopic phenomena and non-relativistic energies. He's one of the found, founders of um, quantum mechanics and he actually won the Nobel Prize for discovering this equation. And if you solve this equation, you actually use atomic orbitals, which basically kind of means that you actually be able to find out how the boxes that the electrons are placed in in every single atom and as well as what are the energy levels of these different boxes. So I'll elaborate more on this as in it will get a bit, it's a bit complicated at the start but rest assured that you'll get clearer towards the end. So just bear with me for the moment. Okay, so an atomic orbital is essentially a probability density function describing the probability of finding an electron in different regions of space. This is really the proper definition for an atomic orbital for, but for simplicity sake, right, at the level of A level, you can just think of it as a different boxes that you can place the electrons that an atom has. You have to put it in the correct boxes. And every different atomic orbital has a different energy level and the rule is kind of that you always put if you have one electron, you will always put it into the box that is of the lowest energy level and you have two electrons, you will place the next one in the next box that's of the next higher available energy level. Basically, you want to create the most energetically stable system as you possibly can. Okay, when you solve the Stranger equation, you actually get a set of quantum numbers, the principal quantum number, the azimuthal quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, the, the fourth quantum number, spin quantum number, is actually not gotten when you solve the Schrodinger equation. It's actually put in by hand due to experimental um, results. So you actually only get the first three quantum numbers. And the quantum numbers, you don't actually really have to know them in the A-level, but I will explain to you all how, it's, um, how, it, how it describes the different shapes of the orbitals and the different shapes of the boxes that you're going to place the, the electrons in. Okay, so um, as in, I'm just going to skip all this. If you are interested, this kind of like is taught at a higher level, at university level. So I'm just going to skip all this principal quantum number, azimuthal quantum number, a magnetic quantum number, and the spin quantum number. I'm just going to skip all this. And basically, this is the first time that we will look at the shapes of the orbitals. These are basically the boxes that you are going to place the electrons in. So I'm just going to say a few rules. When at level one, which is the lowest level and energy level, you are going to have the s orbital. And the s orbitals are, the shape of the s orbitals are all spheres. And at when you go to different energy levels, different principal quantum numbers, you all have the s orbital, but they are just different in sizes. So for example, level 1 s orbital is a sphere, but it's smaller in size. Level 2 s orbital is a sphere as well, but larger in size than the level 1 s orbital. And then the level 3 s orbital is bigger in size than the level 2 and the level 1 s orbital. Then when you go to level 2, you will have a new set of orbitals, which is called the p orbitals. And the shape of the p orbitals is in the shape of a dumbbell and it exists in a set of trees. Okay, so like one of the p orbitals will lie along the z axis and we will call this the pz orbital. This is called the pz orbital because it lies along the z axis. This is the py orbital because it lies along the y axis. And this is the px orbital which lies along the x axis. So the p orbitals comes in a set of three. You can think of it as like, for example, if you went to Ikea to buy box shells, right? The shells are like just stuck in three compartments. You either buy the three compartments as a set or you don't buy at all. So when you have, you can't have individual just px, py, pz orbital. They always exist in a set of trees. Whereas for the d orbitals, it looks like the px orbital, oh sorry, it looks like the d orbitals look actually like the p orbitals, but it's actually two separate loops. One loop will be pointing along one of the directions and the other one will be 90 degrees apart from it. So like 
for this orbit uh for this let me see yeah okay so you as you can see right the orbitals here is actually in between the x and the y axis so for this orbital we actually call it the d x y orbital for this one it's in between sorry uh let me see so this is the d y z orbital this is the dyz orbital because the orbitals are in between the z axis and the y axis. This orbital is directly along the x and the y axis. So this orbital is the dx square minus y squared orbital. This is just a way of like a notation to in to basically associate the orientation of the orbitals along the different axis. Whereas for this set of d orbitals, it's uh dx y dyz. So this must be the dxz orbital. It's the because the orbitals are in between the x and the z, in in between the x axis and the z axis. The last set of d orbitals, it's a special, it is a different shape as compared to the other four. And if you were to draw it right, it's like that, as in it looks like a dumbbell shape. And then there is like a donut that's in between this. So this is the way to draw the z squared orbital, where the orientation of the orbital is along the z axis. So this is the dz squared. Orbital. Okay, again, like the p orbitals always exist in a set of three, the d orbitals always exist in a set of five. You cannot have only one, like for example, dxy orbital, dxz orbital, without the three existing. They must all exist concurrently at the same time. Okay, so um, again, this is just another shape of the orbitals. And the important thing about these orbitals is the relative energies of the orbitals because as I've mentioned, right, like for example, if you've got 10 electrons, you will want to place the 10 electrons in the different orbitals, place them into the right boxes. But the rule is that because not all the orbitals have the same energy levels. So if you have one electron, you will always want to place it into the orbital that is of the lowest energy so that you create the most stable electronic configuration possible. Basically, you want to create the most stable system that's possible. So this is the energy levels of all the orbitals. If you were at level 1, you will only have the s orbital. When you're at level 2, you will have the s orbital and the p orbital. The s orbital is like almost always lower in energy than the p orbital. Then when you go to level 3, you will have the s orbital, p orbital, and the d orbital. However, notice that here, right? The in, in level 3, the s orbital is lower in energy than the p orbital. However, notice that in level 4, the s orbital here is actually lower in energy than that of the 3d orbital. So when I want to fill electrons, the first electron will be, have priority to go into the 1s orbital because it's of the lowest energy level. The next electrons that go in, okay, so I would also like to mention that in one of this subshell, it actually can fill two electrons each. So if I have one electron, I would place, oops, sorry. If I have one electron, I would place one electron here into this box. And if I have a second electron that I need to fill, I'll put it in here. And like this is the opposite spin, which I'll explain in a while. So basically, electrons actually have spin. So if you were to draw it in, in this way, it will mean spin up. And if you draw it down, it will mean spin down. Okay, and the rule is that if you have two electrons in the same orbital, it must always be placed such that they have opposite spins. It's not allowed for two electrons to have the same spin in a subshell. This will violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So, okay, anyway, this is just a fancy full way of saying that the electrons cannot have the same same spin if they are placed in the same subshell, so you better make sure that they are always placed oppositely spin. If I have another two electrons, I will place it into the next box of lowest energy level, which is the s orbital, which will be here. Ah, what does that keep happening? Here and then here. So those are the next two electrons to be placed. Now the p orbital, right? Because remember just now when we say that like the the s orbital only exists as a set of one. It's just the sphere itself. It's just the sphere. Whereas for the p orbital, it always exists as a set of three orbitals. Hence the p orbital here, right? The, the level two p orbitals actually has three of them. 
has three sets and if I were to place electrons in it I would first, first place one of the electron into one of the, the subshell and then I will place when I want to place the second electron there's two ways that I can do it I can actually place the electron in the second subshell or I can place it into the same same p orbital in the subshell so so basically I can actually do this or I can do this okay so like which one does it actually prefer to be in the answer is actually this case okay so like this is Hans rule Basically, they're saying that if you want to put an electron in the same subshell, you will always prefer to place electrons in a different subshell with the same spin. The reason is this. If you place two electrons with opposite spin in the same orbital, they will actually be closer to one another on average and they will actually experience greater repulsion, which will actually destabilize the system of um, the electronic configuration of the atom. Hence, you will always prefer to place electrons with the same spin in different orbitals so that you kind of like maximize the separation so that you minimize the repulsion and to make the electronic configuration as stable as possible. Okay, so I hope that um, this so this, these are basically rules to how you will feel the electrons and I'll definitely go through some examples to make it all clearer but just and everything will come together so just bear with me for now and just know that if you are going to place electrons in different subshells you will always prioritize to place them in separate subshells with the same spin instead instead of placing electrons in the same subshell with opposite spins so I'm just going to erase this and say that that's the correct one okay so again let's continue to fill electrons right if, if I have one more I will fill it like that and then if I have one more I will now fill in like that and there's no choice now because I have to pair an electron because there's no other way to put it right but just remember that when I put this electron in the same orbital as the existing one it has to be of opposite spin so if I have another electron to put in I will put in here and then I'll put in here whereby this one is for this p orbital Okay, and then when I go to the S, again, I will fill in like this, one up, one down. Then for the P again, is one up, one down. Okay, sorry, shouldn't do that. Okay, so like one, two, three. Then the next one will be, next one will be like that, then like that, then like that. Okay. Notice here that when I go to the next energy level, instead of it filling the 3D, it actually fills the 4S because of this energy, relative energies, which says that the level 4S orbital is actually lower in energy than the level 3D orbital. So as you can see, like how you, you all might be asking like how how can I actually know that whether the energy of the level 4s orbital will it be lower than that of the 3d orbital or vice versa and how can i remember for all these different configurations as you can see that it's like there's many different anomalies right so the answer to this question is actually embedded in the periodic table so i'll show you all how to actually get the energy levels how do you get this information all this information that is written here from the periodic table so if you were to go Okay, let me not use this because I can't write on this. Okay, so you see, right? On in this periodic, the uh, the relative energies of the orbitals is act, the, the in this information is actually embedded within the periodic table. You just have to know how to get that information. So this is like level one. This is level two. This is level three, and this is level four. And this is your S block. This is your P block. And this is your D block. Okay, it's not right there, it's not clear. This is your D block. Okay, so when you go in order from left to right, and then like left to right, and then the next row left to right. Okay, so if you go from left to right, this is one. S. So you will know that the lowest energy level is 1s. Then after that it's uh, okay so as in this this helium is actually here. Okay for unfortunately for this row because like helium is actually placed in the noble gas but you, you can just think of it as being here. So the first row only has 1s. Then when the next energy level will be 2s. 
Okay, then the next one will be 2P. Then like 3S. Then after 3S, the next energy level will be 3P. After that, it's 4S. Okay, and then after that is this D, right? But just remember that this D, although it's in level 4, but because we haven't written the, the level 3D orbitals yet, so instead of being 4D, it's actually 3D. And after 3D, it's go back um, business back as usual, so it's 4P. So this is basically the energy levels from 1s all the way to 4p and in fact you can just go on to level 5 level 6 and that will be that will give you the relative energies of all the orbitals um, that you are required to fill electrons in but for the purpose of a level content most of the time you'll only be asked to fill electronic configurations up to 3d so you don't really have to worry about the rest but let's just make sure that this way of reading right is really consistent with the, the diagram that i've shown you before so 1s, 2s, 2p, 1s, 2s, 2p, okay, then like 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, right? 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, okay? So I hope that um, I've shown you all that indeed if you use the periodic table and read, read it like that, you actually are able to get the relative energies of the orbitals, which will allow you to fill the electrons into the different, um, different orbitals. Okay, so, so now that we've discussed this, we, we said what are orbitals? Orbitals are actually basically, you can think of them as boxes where you need to fill, uh, put the electrons into. And I already told you all that because all the boxes have different energy levels, so you always prioritize putting electrons to the boxes that is of lower energy level. And I also told you all that how you all can get the different, the re different relative energies of the orbitals from the periodic table. And I also told you all about the shapes of the different orbitals. So now we need to uh, practice how do we actually write the electronic configuration. How do we actually put the electrons into the correct orbitals of each atom. Okay, so electronic configuration is the arrangement of electrons of an atom or molecule in their shells and subshells, the different boxes, the different orbitals. And it's constructed from three principles. So the Aufbau principle, the Pauli exclusion principle and Hunt's rule. So the alpha principle says that electron is added into the orbitals in the order of increasing energy, which I have emphasized a lot of times. If you have one electron to put, you always put it into the orbital of lowest energy, followed by the next highest energy level, then the next highest energy level, etc. etc. So that's the alpha principle. And then the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, Pauli again, uh, he actually won the Nobel Prize, I believe, from this principle. So it says the, the exact words is that no two electrons can have the exact same set of quantum numbers, but we don't have to go there. So we just have to say that when you place electrons in the same orbitals, they need to have opposite spin. When one spin up, one of them spins up, the other one must be spin down. You can't put two electrons in the same orbital with the same spin. You will violate the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, Hans rule says that every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with one electron before any one orbital is doubly occupied. And all electrons is singly apart have the same spin. Okay, so what it means is this, right? So just now remember I told you that if you got three um three set of p orbitals, right? And you want to fill two electrons, you can either do this or you can either do this, right? So this one says that every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with one electron before any one orbital is doubly occupied. So this from this rule we know that this is wrong because like the orbital is doubly occupied before uh, is doubly occupied before everything is fully filled and the second thing is that if you place a second electron into a second sub orbital you need to make sure that the spin is the same so like this is the part where it says that all electrons in singly occupied orbitals have the same spin okay so um, all this I hope that everything is tying in much clearer now I understand that things can still be very complicated but as we do examples and as you practice more it will just become natural to you Okay, okay. Pet electrons in the same orbital are okay. So, as in this, is the reason why you prefer to do this rather than this is because electrons that are pet in the same orbital are on average closer to each other and will experience a greater repulsion, and therefore pairing electrons in the same orbital is energetically unfavorable. In fact, it will actually destabilize the system. And since this is more stable than this, 
we will always prefer to place electrons in this setup rather than this setup. Alright, so now let's um, time for some practices. So for example, if you look at the nitrogen atom, so the most important thing that you need to understand is that the nitrogen atom has 7 protons and hence we need to put 7 electrons into the correct orbitals and from the way you read the periodic table, you will know that the 1s orbital is at 1s orbital the, the relative energies is in the order 1s, 2s, then 2p but just remember that when you reach 2p, right, p always exists in a set of 3 orbitals so because it's px, py, pz, so 1 so if you were to draw the if you were to draw the shape of the s orbital, 1s will kind of look something like that, a sphere. The 2s orbital will look like a bigger sphere. It's supposed to be a sphere, it's not a two-dimensional drawing, but I can't draw a 3D sphere. My my drawing is horrible. So but I hope that you all understand that all these are just spheres. And then this set of p orbitals is px, py, pz, which means that one of the orbital is px like that. It is in this direction, it's the px orbital. And then the second one is like that. Okay, so like excuse for the poor drawing, the um the py orbital, and then like you have a pz orbital. Okay, it exists as a set of three. So these three lines that I'm drawing, some sometimes you draw it as boxes, so it's like three boxes. So each box will represent one of the box will represent the px orbital, one of the boxes will represent the py, and one of the box will represent the pz. And just remember that each orbital can always hold two electrons but they must always be of the opposite spin so now we have to actually fill seven electrons and distribute the seven electrons among these orbitals right basically the boxes that can contain the electrons so we'll start by putting the first electron in the lowest energy level so like one of them will be here the second one will be here but of opposite spin due to the poly exclusion principle the third one will go into here the fourth one will go into here so now we have three more to put right so like we will put one here We'll put one here, then again. Oh no. We'll put one here. <laughs> and remember the the last one, the Hans rule? That says that you must put electrons in different orbitals with the same spin first before you pair them up. So the next one to go in will be here, and the next one to go in will be here. So basically this is the electronic configuration of the nitrogen atom. So as you can see here, it's also written as 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, meaning that there are two electrons in the 1s orbital here, two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital as written here, and then three electrons in the 2p orbitals. Of, of course, when you write it in this way, right, all you have written is that there's three electrons in the 2p orbitals, but you never really write whether the electrons are singly paired or doubly paired. But if you write it in this way, it's very clear that they must be singly paired. But even when I write it this way, right, based on your understanding of Hans rule, you must understand that the electrons in the p orbitals are singly paired instead of being doubly paired. Okay, so by the half power principle, the first electron is added into the 1s orbital of lowest energy. The second electron is also added into the 1s orbital of lowest energy. But by the Pauli exclusion principle, the spin of the second electron must be opposite to that of the first electron. In the doubly occupied 1s orbital here must be of opposite spin then continuing on with the filling of electrons the third electron is added into this 2s orbital and the fourth electron is also added into this 2s orbital but they must be opposite spin again by the Pauli exclusion principle okay then by the alpha principle the fifth electron is added into the 2p orbital of the next lowest energy level the sixth electron is also added into the 2p orbital uh, of the next lowest energy level, but by Hans rule, they must be singly occupied with the same spin. Okay, and then the sixth electron is added with the same spin as the fifth electron, as I've gone through just now. So basically, this is the full electronic configuration of the nitrogen atom. Okay, another example, oxygen. So the difference between oxygen and nitrogen is just that oxygen actually has, uh, let me see, oxygen actually has one more electron than that of nitrogen so everything is still the same the first electron goes into the 1s orbital the second electron goes into the 1s orbital with opposite spin based on the Pauli exclusion principle then the third electron goes in the 2s orbital the fourth electron goes in the 2s orbital of opposite spin from that then this is the fifth this is the sixth this is the seventh 
then the eighth one has no choice but to go in into this same orb orbital. It doesn't matter whether you put it here, here or here. There's no difference. But you just need to pay attention that if you put it into here, which is already occupied, it must be opposite spin to the existing one in that orbital. So like this notation basically um, signifies the way the electronic configuration of oxygen in the ground state is two electrons in the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital, and four electrons in the 2p orbitals. Again, written in this way, it doesn't tell you how many electrons is singly paired or doubly paired, but based on what you have learned, you should know that this will be the configuration in the 2p orbitals. Okay, so I'm just going to skip all these slides because um, I have already explained to you uh, in through my voice. <laughs> okay, so the F minus ion, right? So the key is always this. You always need to write out the relative energies of the orbitals as like kind of lines. And then you need to decide how many electrons you have to place in them. How many electrons you have to place in them, then you have to go back to looking at the atom. So the fluoride ion, right, has nine protons. And since it has a charge of plus, sorry, since it has a charge of minus one or one minus, it has actually 10 electrons. So you just go ahead and fill the 10 electrons like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that's how you get the write the electronic configuration of the fluoride ion and written in this way. It's just 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 for a total number of 10 electrons. Okay, so as I've mentioned, it's kind of like the important thing um, in, it's, it, the most important thing is kind of like the most difficult thing to get is I, I would say it's like this relative energy levels because it's not obvious how do we know that the 4s energy level is actually lower than the 3d and you actually need to fill the electrons in the 4s orbital before the 3d but as I've already mentioned and I hope that you all really get it if you all don't you all can just like type it in the comments and I can clarify more um, how to get the relative energy levels from the periodic table so again I would say again level 1 s orbital so 1s then go to level 2 so 2s then 2p 3s 3p 4s and then 3d so just remember that this is 3d and not 4d okay so anyway when you write the electronic configuration for the transition metals there are actually two anomalies and i think most schools actually teach the anomaly in this chapter but um I actually would think that it's a better idea to teach it when you do transition metals, but um, okay, uh, yeah. But I think we'll just leave it to the chapter of transition metals when we go through the atomic, the electronic configuration for the transition metals. Okay, so the learning outcomes describe the number and relative energies of the s, p, and d orbitals for the principal quantum numbers one, two, and three, and also the four s and four p orbitals. So, uh, what it means that what the relative energies of the one, one s, two s, two p, three. 3s, 3p, and 3d, and 4s, 4p orbitals. Like describe the relative energy. So, so again, one one s first, then two s, then two p, then three s, then three p, then four uh, s, three d, and then four p. So in In, uh, in increasing a level of energies. Okay, the 1s is the lowest energy followed by 4p at the highest. So that's what it's trying to say here. The principal number is you can think of it as the level. The, the lower the level, the more at the the lower the energy of the orbital. Okay, describe the shapes of s, p, and d orbitals. So knowledge of wave functions is not required. So the knowledge of wave function is basically like kind of when you solve the Schrodinger equation, that's where all the orbitals come from. So some of my students is like very very curious right they, they say like how, how do we know that the orbitals actually looks like this shape so it's it's just that actually when you solve this mathematical equation you would arrive at a set of functions and if you plot it on the x y and z axis it will look exactly like this so it actually comes from the solution to the Stranger equation which is obviously not in the syllabus okay but i guess it's good to know where everything comes from okay so but so to this learning outcome, right, describe the shapes of s, p, and d orbitals. So like some of my students also ask, do I need to know how to draw 
the S orbital, the P orbital, and the D orbital. So my answer to my students is always, is it in the learning outcomes? If the answer is yes, you better know how you better know that you need to know how to draw them. And obviously you need to know how to draw them because it's explicitly written here in the learning outcomes. So again, if you were to draw the S orbital, it would just be a sphere. If you were to draw the P orbitals, you need to draw three of them. One along the x-axis, one along the y-axis, one along the z-axis. Then for the d orbitals, right, because the d orbitals is like in a 3D shape, so kind of like we don't really have to draw it in a 3D shape. So what we can actually do is just like that. So draw a loop like that, and then like that. And then place... <laughs> okay, this is not going very well for the drawing part like that and then like that right okay and then like you can place the axis okay so like this and then like this right if you label the x and y here then this will be the dx square minus y squared like i told you already the x square minus y squared the dxy dxz all this stuff is just to label whether the x the the orbitals are in between what axis so okay then like for completeness sake i'm just going to draw everything so like if i have the x and y orbitals here and the orbitals are in between the x and the y axis then this will be the the x y orbital and then yeah so as in honestly you can just repeat the same diagram it doesn't matter but when you are labeling just make sure that you're labeling like y and then z and then this will be the dyz and then like for the last one it really doesn't matter you can just draw the exact same shape just know that it's like it's kind of like 2p loops but you need to understand that like this entire thing is just 1d orbital so what's the one that i'm missing the xz right so like this is x and this is z and this will be the dxz okay so just pay attention to the last one the dz square orbital the dz square orbital it looks like a p loop like that but with the donut that's in in the middle and then just to make sure that okay for this one you have no choice definitely it has to be along the z axis and this will be the dz square orbital okay so this is how you draw the d orbitals the p orbitals um, should be quite obvious so i'm not going to repeat that and the s orbital is just a sphere again and the state the electronic configuration of atoms and ions given the proton number and charge if you're given the proton number and the charge you'll be able to tell the number of electrons of either the atoms of the ions that it has and then after you figure out the relative energies of the orbitals you can just fill it in just as i've taught you based on these three principles the half valve principle hans rule and the poly exclusion principle okay so basically that is that for the learning outcome Okay, so on to some questions for um, this electronic configuration. I'll, I'll probably actually end off the, the stream after I go through these questions for the electronic configuration because uh, this is content that is really quite new to students that have just finished O-level um, chemistry. So uh, y'all can take some time to digest this and then uh, y'all can ask me any questions that y'all have or I'll just answer the questions in the next stream, uh, in the next stream during next Monday. Okay, so uh, use of uh, which particle would on losing an electron have a half fill set of p orbitals? Okay, so carbon c minus, right? So first we have to figure out the number of electrons that this c minus ion has. So if you were to look at carbon, carbon actually has a proton number of six, which means that the c minus ion actually has seven electrons in total. So if you were to like draw this one s, two s, and then two p six. So this is 1s, right? This is 2s. And then this is 2p. Okay, so we have to fill in the total number of 7 electrons in here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, sorry. Let's read the question again. Which particle on losing an electron will have a half filled set of p orbitals? When this one loses an electron, it will actually go back to the carbon 
atom, which means that it will only have six electrons, and this would be the electronic configuration of that particle, which is carbon. Okay, so again, uh, on losing an electron, meaning that this one will actually turn into C. Okay, on the other hand, nitrogen has seven uh, has a proton number of seven and hence it has seven electrons so if we were to draw it out like this right you would feel one two three four five six the reason is six is because on losing an electron so when you lose an electron it will actually become the m plus ion which it will only have six electrons which is the same electronic configuration as the carbon so the answer will actually be n minus, right? Because like if it's n minus, it will have exactly seven electrons. It will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this will have a half filled set of half filled set of p orbitals. Anyway, half filled, right? Because like this p orbitals can hold a total number of six electrons, right? So if it's half filled, basically it just means that there's three electrons in all the set of in the set of the p orbitals so therefore this is the answer just for completeness sake if we look at the o plus ion right if you lose an electron it will become the o2 plus if you look at the proton number of oxygen it's actually eight so the o2 plus will actually only have six electrons and it will have the exact same electronic configuration as a and b so a b and d actually has the exact same electronic configuration which is this and they don't have a half filled set of p orbitals because it only has two electrons in the p orbitals whereas for m minus is three electrons in the p orbitals and hence is half filled okay which one of the following does not contain either an unpaired s electron or an unpaired p electron so the you see right as in after you read the question you would know that in order to do this kind of question you must always first write out the electronic configuration before you can decide whether it contains or doesn't contain an unpaired s electron or an unpaired p electron Okay, so for chromium, chromium is here. So if you were to write the electronic configuration, right, it will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then 3d4. Okay, 1s. Okay, so let me just skip this question for the time being. The, the reason is because that is, um, in, in order to do this question, you actually have to know the, the, the anomalies of filling that electron for um, a transition metal. So for the time being, I'm just going to skip this question and we'll come back to this. Okay, so we'll just finish this last question before I end off this stream. Which arrangement of the four electrons of highest energy corresponds to the ground state of an element in group 4? Which arrangement of the four electrons of highest energy corresponds to the ground state of element? Okay, so if you look and for an element in uh from an element in group four, like for example the carbon, the electronic configuration will be okay, so if you have one, two, and then this, you will put one electron here, two electron, three, four. Uh, okay, sorry. So carbon has six electrons, right? We need to fill six electrons into the different orbitals. So like one, two, three, four, then five, and six. And therefore, the way that's written here is like one s. There's two electrons in the one s orbital. Two electrons in the two s orbital, and then two electrons in the p orbital. So this will be the answer. And the four electrons of the highest energy level will be this. So it's. 2s2 2p2 the answer will be b okay so i i hope that you'll get the gist of this that in order to do this type of questions you must always first write out the electronic configuration before you are able to decide because if you don't write it out nobody will you, you won't be able to like immediately jump from the question to the answer so it's, it's kind of like when, when you think about things you must always think think in a linear way like a leads to B and B leads to C and C leads to D and therefore that's the answer. So like so for example this question is in group four. So an example of an element in group four is carbon, so it has six electrons. Therefore I will write out the electronic configuration of the carbon that's in group four. 
then I'll decide. Okay, hence the four electrons of highest energy, and this is the four electrons of the highest energy, which corresponds to 2s2, 2p2, and therefore the answer is b. So you must always think in a linear fashion, like this therefore results in this, results in that, before you can get to the final answer. Okay, so as I've mentioned, because the next session is on uh, ne next section is on ionization energies, so I'm just going to end the stream um, today. So uh, feel free to leave any of your comments in the stream, like any improvements or any feedback that you all can give, or any questions that you all have regarding the stream or the content of the material that I've gone through, and I'll be happy to answer them uh, the next session. So yeah. Thank you for tuning in um, and see you all next in my next stream on next Monday at 8 p.m. again. Good night, everybody.